here we go. Okay, so section two is on nuclear decays and reactions. And the main idea is that incredibly high energy particles are released during nuclear decays and reactions. So in the first section, we learned about what it meant for a nucleus to be stable. We talked about the neutron to proton ratio and how the interplay between the strong force and electric force will either allow a nucleus to be stable or a nucleus to be unstable. And we call those radioactive. And so we found that the larger the atom was, the bigger the nucleus, the bigger the nucleus, the more protons for repulsion, the more protons for repulsion, the less stable the nucleus would be. So anything above lead, so bismuth and beyond, is going to be or is going to have um, unstable radioactive isotopes. And so now we want to look at what happens when these nuclei are unstable. And so we want to talk about alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays. We want to explore uh, nuclear fission and also nuclear fusion. So fission is splitting apart, fusion is coming together. Some new terms for us, we have alpha particle, beta particle, transmutation and chain reaction. All right, so when we have an unstable nucleus, one of three things is going to occur. There's gonna be alpha decay, beta decay or gamma radiation or gam gamma decay ray rays uh, we don't call it typically gamma radiation i know it says that in this slide but gamma radiation actually you can call that uh, gamma radiation is different from alpha and beta in that it is just energy there's no particles whereas alpha and beta we actually have particles coming out of the nucleus and so um, when we have an unstable nucleus, it's going to decay via one of these three different radioactive decay methods, alpha, beta, or gamma. So we're naming, naming them after the Greek um, letters. The alpha and beta radiation, these are particle radiation forms. And then the gamma radiation is an electromagnetic wave. And so we've previously learned about the electromagnetic radiation spectrum where there's visible light, uh, that's where we could see right below that is infrared and then we can move on to less energy higher wavelength like radio waves and then going the other way from visible light we move into smaller wavelength more energy uv uh, radiation and then beyond that we have uh, x-rays and gamma rays and so um, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the electromagnetic waves we're talking about the light spectrum and so the first one is alpha decay so alpha decay is a loss of an alpha particle. So alpha and beta are particles, gamma is energy. And what an alpha particle is, is it's two protons and two neutrons. And so if I look at this little model here, I could see I have two protons and two neutrons. And we can symbolize this with the isotope for helium-4. So helium has two protons, and when it has two neutrons, its mass number is four. And so an alpha particle is the same thing as a helium nucleus. We cannot say, however, that an alpha particle is the same thing as a helium atom, because the difference there is that a helium atom is going to have electrons. Alpha particles do not have electrons. Therefore, they are charged. So alpha particles are charged. And because they're, they have two protons and no electrons, they're going to have a positive two charge. And so they are charged entities. These are the particles that Ernest Rutherford used in his gold foil experiment to discover the nucleus. These particles are smaller than most uh, nuclei, almost all nuclei. Therefore, uh, he was able to bombard gold foil with them and see the approximate size of the, the mass of the nucleus. So we have an unstable atom. That unstable atom wants to decay. And so it does through alpha decay, which is the first type of decay we're learning. When it undergoes alpha decay, it releases an alpha particle. This alpha particle is the same as a helium nucleus. So therefore we can represent it with a helium isotope symbol. It has no electrons. So therefore it has a positive two charge from the positive two, from the two protons that are present. And these, can be stopped by approximately a sheet of paper. So if you had a radioactive source that was emitting alpha radiation, you could hold up a piece of paper and stop it, okay? 
And so alpha particles are in terms of um, how dangerous they are to biological beings such as ourselves, they are the least dangerous form of radiation. Okay, so alpha decay. And so here is your first uh, radioactive decay equation. So this, we're starting with uranium-238. Uranium-238 has 92 protons and a balance of neutrons. And so if I were to find the neutron to proton ratio, so I could actually do that real quick. Let me pull up a calculator. And so if the mass number is 238, I subtract out 92, I have 146 neutrons. And if I want the neutron to proton ratio, 146 divided by the number of protons, 92, I have a neutron to proton ratio of 1.58. Previously, uh, two days ago on Tuesday, we learned that Anything beyond a neutron to proton ratio of 3 to 2, which is the same thing as 1.5, is going to be unstable. Because uranium-238 has a neutron to proton ratio of 1.58, it is unstable, and it's going to undergo decay, radioactive decay, in this case, alpha decay. And so since uranium-238 is unstable, it'll undergo alpha decay, and so it'll release this helium nucleus, this alpha particle, as a result. And so we see it show up on the product side of the equation. And so we start with uranium-238. On the product side, we have uh, a helium nucleus, an alpha particle. And then this middle one is the difference between the uranium-238, the reactant, and the alpha particle that's emitted. So uranium-238, we're losing an alpha particle. An alpha particle is four nucleons large. Remember what nucleon means. It means particles in the nucleus. So if an alpha particle is four nucleons large, we're going from a mass number of 238, subtracting four, and we get 234. So 238 minus four is 234. And then also this alpha particle, it has two protons in it. And so for the atomic number, the proton count, on the bottom left of the isotop symbol, we're losing two. So the top we're losing four, the bottom we're losing two. And we, we, we could see that because that's what the alpha particle is. We're losing an alpha particle. We're losing four on the top and two on the bottom. So 238 minus four is 234. 92 minus two is 90, okay? And so if I were to look up on my periodic table, what is atomic number 90? Well, it's gonna be thorium. And so that's how we're able to determine what this particle is. It's thorium-234. And so if I were to tell you, okay, this entity, uranium-238, undergoes alpha decay, that's all I would have to tell you, and you can construct this equation. You would start with uranium-238. So you put U, and you put the mass number 238 at the top left. You'd find uranium on the periodic table, find that it was atomic number 92, and so you'd ha now have the isotope symbol for uranium-238. You'd put your arrow, your reaction arrow, because it's going to decay. And I told you it undergoes alpha decay, so it's going to lose this alpha particle, which is a helium nucleus. So helium, four, and then it has an atomic number of two. And then the last thing is to find the remaining particle. So after uranium-238 has lost an alpha particle, what shows up? Well, it's 238 minus 4 is 234, 92 minus 2 is 90, look up 90 on the periodic table, you get thorium, okay? So that's alpha decay. Largest radioactive particle, positive two charge, can stop it with a sheet of paper. Some unstable nuclei, some radioactive uh, nuclei will undergo beta decay. Beta decay is a lot smaller, a lot, 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 lot smaller than alpha decay, okay? Remember, alpha decay is four nucleons large, two protons, two neutrons. Beta, beta decay, on the other hand, is just an electron. And so you will recall that electrons are extremely, extremely small compared to a proton or a neutron. We'll now compare that electron size to four of those protons or neutrons, because that's what an alpha particle is. And so beta decay, beta particles are extremely small compared to alpha particles. Okay. And so beta decay is the loss of a beta particle, which is the same thing as a high energy electron. And so what happens in beta decay is you start with your nucleus and a neutron gets converted to a proton. And when that neutron gets converted to a proton, it emits 
a beta particle or a high powered electron. I want to pull up a table from way long ago when we were learning about, let's see here, what chapter was this? This was chapter uh, 16. So I'm pulling this up on my other screen. Oh, it's loading here now. And so we had, uh, hopefully you recognize the chart. Oh, of course I can't find it. Okay, here it is. So hopefully you recognize this chart. And so this shows us the relative masses of electrons, protons, and neutrons. We see that electrons are 1, 1,840th of the size of protons and neutrons. And so that gives you a better understanding of the size disparity between a beta particle, which is one electron, and an alpha particle, which is four nucleons, protons and neutrons. Okay. Uh, but what I wanted to draw your attention to in this case was the mass of the proton and the neutron. We said that the masses are approximately the same, the relative mass is one. But if you take a closer look down here, you'll see that, so proton is the top row, you'll see that the proton is 1.673 times 10 to the negative 24th, where a, while a neutron is 1.675 times 10 to the negative 24th. And so we find that the neutron is slightly larger than a proton, okay? And that's going to be important for understanding beta decay. So if I go back to uh, my beta decay slideshow, I lost my slide. Here it is. What happens in beta decay is a neutron, the larger of the two, so neutrons are slightly bigger than protons, a neutron gets converted to a proton and an electron, a beta particle, is ejected. I like to think about it like this. The neutron being slightly larger has a little bit of mass to lose. That little bit of mass, that's the electron that's being ejected. So the neutron turns into a proton, so the bigger nucleon turns into the smaller nucleon and ejects a little bit of mass. And that little bit of mass is the beta particle, that's the electron. And so when the larger particle, the neutron, ejects a little bit of mass, it gets smaller, that's how it becomes the proton. And so also you could think about it in terms of the charge. Neutron is neutral. If it ejects an electron, it's losing negative charge. And if it's losing negative charge, it's going to leave some positive behind. And so that's why the neutral neutron, one, gets smaller because it's losing that mass of an electron, and two, becomes positively charged because it's losing the charge, the negative charge of that electron that it lost. Okay. So the two things that are occurring during beta decay are neutrons converted to protons. That's the first thing. Second thing, high energy electron is e emitted. And that high energy electron that's emitted, we call that the beta particle. Okay. And like I already said, the beta particle is way, 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 way smaller than an alpha particle. And you can see right here, it says it's approximately one seven thousandth the, the mass of an alpha particle. So way, way smaller. Um, because it is high energy and it is much smaller, they are more damaging to bio biological entities. Um, so if this were to uh, go through one of your cells and potentially your nucleus, guess what? It's small enough and it's a high enough energy. It's going to go right through your cell bilipid layer. It's going to go through all of those cell organelles. It could potentially go through a nucleus and blast apart the DNA. Okay, That's how small it is. And so these beta particles can be very damaging to biological entities because it could damage the DNA. It's so small and it's so high power to get propelled through that stuff. And so uh, in order to stop a beta decay, a beta particle, you need a sheet of aluminum that's about three millimeters thick. So think about a sheet of aluminum, okay? That's a lot denser than paper, it's, uh, it's a metal. And so if you can stop an alpha particle with a piece of paper, you're gonna need a, a sheet of aluminum foil to stop uh, a beta particle, okay? Beta particles being a lot smaller and higher energy are going to be a lot more damaging than alpha particles. Okay, and so we can symbolize a beta particle with one of these two things. So we have we can have the lowercase Greek letter beta, which is kind of looks like a capital B, italicized with the tail on it. And then let's look at the the mass number. Okay, remember the mass number is the number of nucleons, protons and neutrons. Since a beta particle has neither protons nor neutrons, therefore it has a mass number of zero. That's why we have the zero on the top. And then 
the bottom number is the atomic number, okay? And so it has no protons, it has no positive charge, it actually has the opposite of a positive charge. So therefore we put a negative one for the, the bottom left number. And so we could symbolize beta particles with a lowercase Greek letter beta, or we could symbolize it just with an E to saying that we have an electron, okay? And remember the mass number is zero and the atomic number of the charge is negative one. And so when we go to look at an equation, so let's say that I, I told you iodine 131 undergoes beta decay. Okay, this is how you, you, go, you go about this. You say, okay, iodine, capital I, 131, top left. Find iodine that on the periodic table, the proton number, the atomic number is 53. So now we have the symbol for iodine 131. So iodine 131 with atomic number 53. I told you it undergoes beta decay. So on the right side of the arrow, we put a beta particle. This one is using the lowercase e to symbolize the electron, mass number of zero, charge negative one. And then the last piece we need to identify is the, the particle that's in the middle. Well, when iodine-131 undergoes beta decay, it converts a, no, a neutron to a proton and it loses an, loses an electron. So when it converts the neutron to the proton, we're not losing a neutron, we're not losing a proton, we're not losing any nucleons at all. And so the mass number stays at 131. Okay, but remember it, it converts a neutron to a proton to eject that high powered beta electron. And so in converting the neutron to a proton, we actually increase the atomic number because if neutron, neutrons aren't accounted for in this bottom atomic number, when we gain a proton, we're going to increase that number by, by one. So we had iodine-131 and then we increase the number of protons because we're converting a neutron to a proton and we get 54, which is xenon. So we convert iodine-131 to xenon-131, mass number didn't change, proton number increased by one, and then we emitted that high-powered electron, that beta particle, okay? That's beta decay. So we have alpha decay and beta decay. The next thing is gamma emission. So alpha, beta, gamma. Gamma is not even a particle, okay? It is just a high-powered energy wave. That's all it is. And so it's the loss of a gamma ray. And so this is the lowercase Greek letter gamma. So it to, to write this symbol, it's kind of like if you look at it sideways, it's kind of like a really wide two that's extremely sideways. So kind of look for the two in there. We're used to uh, drawing the number two. And so by drawing a two at, at an extreme angle and then making it very wide, we can accomplish that gamma symbol, okay? It technically does have this little loop on the end, but that loop is so slight that you could just make a, a really sideways two and that will be gamma. Um, when you are writing the, the lowercase Greek letter gamma, you have to make sure that you're not writing the lowercase Greek letter nu. So let me pull up the difference here. Let me see if I can find an image that compares both of them. Mm. Okay. Here is an image. All right. So here are the lowercase Greek letters. Alpha we're using up here. So it's kind of like a an A. So you can see your traditional A, but it's got this, this extra piece up here. The extra piece up here beta like i said it's a kind of like a capital b with a tail on it gamma is the next one we're using so you can kind of look for that sideways too very slight loop down here and what i don't want you to confuse it with is this symbol down here new new uh can be drawn very similar but new kind of you can kind of see the, the subtle difference. Uh, this piece of it curves to the left, whereas in a gamma, it curves to the right, okay? So we're just using the first three alpha, beta, gamma, okay? Um, and we're not using any other Greek letters. So that is a gamma symbol. And so, we saw that we could symbolize alpha with a helium nucleus, so two, four, 
because it has mass of four and it has two protons. We saw that we symbolized a beta particle with a lowercase squeeze letter beta, negative one with zero because it is massless. Gamma rays are massless, just like beta particles, and they have no charge. They have no positive charge, no negative charge. So we have zero on top of another zero with our lowercase Greek letter gamma. Okay, these are often, so whenever something undergoes alpha decay, even sometimes beta, there's often, it's often accompanied by this gamma emission. And so while alpha particles, um, when they are emitted, they're relatively safe because they can be stopped by a piece of paper or your skin, they're often accompanied by gamma rays, which are extremely dangerous. They are so dangerous because they have no mass, they're so small, and they're very high energy. They're higher energy than beta, and they're smaller than beta as well. Because, I mean, they're essentially massless. And so they're a high energy, high frequency electromagnetic wave. The symbol is lowercase quick letter gamma. They have no mass, they have no charge. And so look, what, look what's needed to stop these ones. Thick blocks of lead, okay? We're talking about blocks of lead, thick blocks of lead. So alpha was a piece of paper, beta was a piece of aluminum foil, Gamma, different story altogether. Because it's essentially massless and it's just high energy, we need something to absorb that energy. So we use thick blocks of lead. Uh, in actual nuclear reactors for power plants, they, they have it submerged in a lot of water and they use the water to absorb it as well. So thick blocks of lead or um, feet of water. So no mass, no charge, and they travel at the speed of light. Okay, very dangerous. Uh, they can mutate your DNA, no problem. So alpha, beta, gamma. So those are the, the those are the three types of radiation that we're looking at. There are other forms of radi radiation, um, like K capture and positron emission, but those are more advanced and they're beyond the scope of this course. So we're not going to worry about those. And so, like I've been mentioning mentioning all along, alpha, beta, and gamma radiation can be dangerous to human tissue. Uh, it causes cells to function improperly. Like I said, beta and gamma can blast right through the cells, damage the DNA is the, the biggest problem. And then since the DNA controls all of the proteins in the cell and pretty much the functionality of living organisms, if the, if the DNA can be damaged, then it obviously causes uh, abnor abnormal function. And so this can lead to illness, uh, disease such as cancer, and if it's severe enough, death. Okay, And so we have this a uh, picture of this lady and you could see <laughs> i don't know why they did this but you can see she's stopping this alpha particle with her nose the beta particle can kind of go into her hand x-ray can go through and it's stopped by bone we don't really cover x-rays uh and then gamma ray go right through her okay so she i don't know this is a, such a weird picture to me she's like got her scrub pants on she's wearing socks i don't know anyway that gives you a, a sense of the penetrating ability of alpha, beta, and gamma rays. All right, so moving on to what happens when we have one atom switch to another through these decay processes, we call this transmutation, transmutation, because the starting atom is mutated or transposed, it's, it's changed into a different atom altogether. And so this occurs because alpha decay, we're losing two protons and two neutrons through the alpha particle. And then for beta decay, we're converting a neutron to a proton and, and we're losing an electron. And so here we have an example of a transmutation of polonium-210. When polonium-210 has 84 protons, when it loses an alpha particle, it becomes lead-82. Every time a unstable nucleus undergoes decay, it's going to become more stable. And so when polonium transmutates into uh, lead 206, it becomes more stable. And so that's the whole goal of uh, when a, an unstable atom undergoes radiation or radioactivity or uh, decay. It's trying to become more stable. And so polonium 210 becomes more stable by emitting that alpha particle, that helium nucleus. Iodine-131, uh, it's going to undergo a different, it's gonna undergo beta decay. And so when iodine-131 undergoes beta decay, it transmutates into xenon-131. So whenever we're switching from one element, so polonium to lead or iodine to xenon, we call it transmutation, okay? And it's going to occur so that the, the nucleus can become more stable. Depending on the neutron to proton ratio, we could have extra neutrons or not enough neutrons. 
Okay. If we have, uh, depending on that ratio, depending on exactly what's going on with the nucleus, different forms of radiation will occur. Okay. And so if it's simply just too large, it's going to undergo alpha decay. If it uh, has just a few extra two neutrons, it'll undergo beta decay. Okay. And so we're not going to really worry ourselves with determining what type of decay it undergoes. In all instances for this course, I'm just going to tell you, this one undergoes alpha. This one undergoes beta. Okay. So how does this apply to our daily lives? Um, in your homes, hopefully you have a smoke detector. The way smoke detectors work is they have a radioactive isotope uh, of uh, americium-241. Americium-241 is radioactive and it undergoes alpha decay. And so you actually have an alpha alpha particle emitting source in your home through your smoke detector. And the way alpha particles work, or the way americium-241 works in your smoke detector, is it, it's emitting all these alpha particles. So you could see them flying through here. And uh, when the alpha particles strike oxygen in the air, remember oxygen is 20% of the air that we breathe. So when the alpha particles strike the oxygen, they kind of rip them apart, they ionize them. And so uh, they, they blast off some pieces and we get negatives and positives. Those negatives and positives are obviously in the gas phase and that can create a circuit and so that's what the smoke detector is. We have a battery hooked up, and then we have these two plates separated, very thin separation, and then we have americium there. And so when the americium is decaying, alpha decay, it's breaking apart oxygen atoms, and that allows this circuit to be completed, okay? And so as long as that circuit is completed, the smoke detector is it's functioning correctly, it's, it's working fine, it's not going off. As soon as that circuit is no longer completed, so if there's a break in the circuit, so we no longer have the continuous ionization at a certain rate of the oxygen molecules between these plates, if that stops or there's something gets in the way, then this circuit is broken and then there's a backup circuit that allows the battery to sound an alarm. It makes it go, it makes the alarm go off, right? And so what causes that to occur? Well, what causes that to occur is something else besides the oxygen atoms gets between these two plates, in this case, smoke. Or if you have that very unfortunate home setup, like my girlfriend does, if you have a smoke detector right outside your bathroom and you open the bathroom door, steam gets in there, that can set it off too. Or if you have a smoke detector in your kitchen, which is a good idea, but if it's too close to maybe your toaster, it's gonna set it off. Anything that's gonna get in there and interrupt the ionization of the oxygen molecules from the alpha particles striking them, and it interrupts that, it's gonna break that circuit and it's gonna trip the backup circuit and it's gonna cause the alarm to go off, okay? So that's how a smoke detector works. It has a uh, radioactive source of um, americium-241, which emits alpha particles. Okay, the next thing we are gonna talk about is nuclear fission. Nuclear fission is the type of um, radioactive decay. It's the type of um, nuclear chemistry that's involved with both nuclear power plants and nuclear bombs. And so what occurs with fission is this. So we can look at this diagram here. We start with first a fissionable uh, we start with fissionable material. So we're looking for a nucleus or an atom with a nucleus that's extremely unstable. So uranium-235 is extremely unstable. Most uranium is in the form of uranium-238, which undergoes uh, radioactive decay, but it's, it's not as unstable as uranium-235. Uranium-235 is an extremely unstable isotope. We call this weapons-grade uranium or fissionable uranium, uranium-235. And so it's it's so unstable that if we were to bombard it with a neutron, adding that neutron to the uranium-235 and making it uranium-236 makes it even more unstable. So unstable that instead of undergoing alpha decay or beta decay, it just breaks apart. It literally just, it's like, nope, breaks apart into what we call two daughter cells, okay? So uranium-235, very unstable. Add one more neutron to it, becomes uranium-236, 
so unstable it can't exist on its own, breaks apart into what we call two daughter cells. And those two daughter cells are krypton, or two daughter nuclei, krypton and I'm thinking about meiosis and mitosis. But uh, krypton 91 is one daughter nucleus, and the other one is barium 142. Okay, so uranium-236 becomes so unstable, we form krypton-91, barium-142, and we also get a lot of extra neutrons and energy, okay? We harvest this energy, we use it to heat water, which converts to steam, which turns a turbine, and that's, that's how a nuclear power plant works, okay? If, so if you look at these three neutrons, these three neutrons can then go on to bombard other uranium 235s and cause more of this fission to occur. So fission is the splitting of an atom. So nuclear fission, splitting of a nucleus. Fission versus fusion. Fusion is coming together, fission is breaking apart. Okay, so here is uh, that reaction. We have uranium 235, we're adding a neutron, it becomes uh, these two uh, daughter isotopes, barium 142, krypton 91, and we get three extra neutrons as a result. And we should also add in energy over here. It produces a lot of energy. That's the whole purpose of fission, for our purposes at least. Um, so these three neutrons here, depending on what we allow them to do, we could either have a chain reaction that expands more, or we could absorb these neutrons and kind of control this reaction. So that's what we want to look at next. And so if I let those neutrons kind of fly loose, Every one neutron will split another atom and cause three more. Each one of those three becomes three more and three more and three more, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. This is called a chain reaction. When one thing leads to another, it causes the next, uh, the causes the next uh, event to occur. That is, uh oh, someone said something in the chat. Haley, I am here. I okay, good. I'll mark you here. Um, so that chain reaction causes more fission events to occur and more fission events to occur. And so every event is linked to each other. So that's why we call it a chain. Uh, and so this is a chain reaction. And so looking back at this one, and so if we have one neutron coming in, three neutrons coming out, each one of these neutrons can initiate another fission event. So that's called a chain reaction. Boom, boom, boom. And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until we run out of fissionable material, okay? And so we could describe fission reactions in one of three ways, subcritical, critical, or supercritical. So subcritical is when we are getting fewer and fewer neutrons after fission events. So we're doing something to absorb the neutrons. And so that's a controlled, actually it's, it's a reaction that's not really doing anything for us. Uh, a critical mass is when one neutron's coming in, one's coming out. Okay, so we're not gaining any extra neutrons to cause the reaction to get any bigger. It's, it's controlled. Okay, that's what we do. That's what we use in power plants. Supercritical, we're, we're putting in one, we're getting in three, we're getting three out. And we're putting in the, each one of those three becomes three more. And each one of those three becomes three more. So it's expanding. We call that supercritical. So we have subcritical, the reaction is starting to stop. Critical, the reaction is this, it's not increasing, it's not decreasing and supercritical interaction is getting bigger and bigger, okay? And so when we have a sustained controlled reaction, that is critical, that's how we use, that's what we use in a nuclear power plant. Supercritical, that's what we initiate when we uh, use an atomic bomb, as we learned in the Manhattan uh, Project, okay? So that kind of just talks about the same thing. Subcritical, the reaction stops. Critical, we have sustained reaction. Supercritical, violent explosion. So this is how a nuclear power plant works. So the nuclear power plant, we have, so let me zoom in here. This is where, this is the reactor core. This is where the, the fissionable material is. And we allow the fission to occur. We have these control rods made of boron that are capable of, of absorbing neutrons. If we can absorb the neutrons, we can control the reaction. And so that's how we create this critical reaction that is safe. And so remember, when the fission reaction occurs, we're releasing a lot of energy. Well, what do we do with that energy? 
we use that energy to heat water. So we heat water, so we're pumping water through here continuously. And so when it, it's pumped in, it's cooler, and then the, the fission reaction heats it up, and it's pumped through here, and it causes another chamber to boil, and then it causes steam. You learned in ninth grade in environmental science, pretty much every power plant you could think of is doing something to turn a turbine, whether we're using wind, whether we are burning coal to create heat uh, and heat water and create steam to turn a turbine, uh, whether we have a hydroelectric power plant where we are, we're taking the water flow and having it flow through turbines. Uh, all of those examples, we're turning a turbine. And so a nuclear power plant is no different. We use the fission reaction to heat the water, the water goes to steam, the steam is, goes through a turbine, the turbine turns and then turns an electric generator and makes electricity. The water is then cooled and condensed and then pumped back through in an endless cycle, or it can be returned to uh, another water containment area. Okay, so that's how a nuclear power plant works. Okay, but it's critical that we're able to control that fission reaction. The, the reaction is kept in check by using control rods. Control rods can be lowered, which causes the reaction to stop because all the neutrons are being absorbed, or they can be raised up, and uh, some of the neutrons um, are allowed to proceed with the, the chain reaction. So these rods block the path of some neutrons, keeping the system from reaching a dangerous supercritical, supercritical mass. And uh, the last thing is nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is the opposite of fission. Instead of splitting an unstable nucleus apart and getting daughter nuclei, we have small nucleus or small atoms and nuclei that we start with and we fuse them together. We previously learned that if protons or any particles are close enough, uh, then we're going to have this strong force. Well, when uh, the strong force initiates, it releases energy. And so the fusion process, so if we take hydrogen and we fuse it together to make helium, it releases a lot of energy. The problem with this is that in order to get protons that close together, we need a very high temperature, okay? And so fusion on Earth is not very practical because of the, the energy needed to initiate it. It's not efficient. Um, so nuclear fusion is actually what occurs in the stars. And so our sun, for example, Sol, it is taking hydrogen and it is, it is continuously fusing it to helium. In later stages of the star, uh, they'll, it'll be out of hydrogen and it'll, then it'll start fusing helium into larger atoms, okay? And the way that stars die is that um, all of the small atoms have been fused to larger atoms and then the density increases and then it, it kind of, uh, it, it will collapse in on itself. And so um, the reason why it, fusion is practical for stars is because the fusion process has already been initiated and all the energy that's being let off from the fusion process, that energy is just used in an endless positive feedback loop of causing more fusion to occur. So since a star is sufficient, has sufficient energy to begin with, the fusion process will continue to occur, okay? Um, that can't happen on Earth because we don't have the initiation energy and we don't have enough material, we don't have enough hydrogen in one place to continuously fuse. And so fusion reactions are not practical um, while they might be more efficient in terms of energy production, they're not practical on Earth because uh, we don't have enough fusionable material. And in order to get those protons close enough to initiate the strong force, uh, it requires immense amounts of energy, which we can accomplish. And so this is the, the fusion reaction. So this, this diagram, we have uh, hydrogen 1 and hydrogen 2 fusing to helium 3, but helium 3 can also fuse with additional hydrogen to create helium 4. And so our star is continuously fusing hydrogen to form helium. And then it's releasing energy. And then you can see this one is releasing, this is called a positron. It looks very similar to a beta particle, but you'll notice that this one is not a negative one, it's a positive one. So a positron is the exact same mass as an electron, but has a positive charge. Positrons um, combine immediately with free electrons. Um, therefore, positrons don't really exist for any period of time. So I already talked about uh, the fusion. Only at temperatures of millions of degrees Celsius are nuclei moving fast enough to get close enough for fusion to occur. And so when two protons kind of collide, they're going to repel immediately. 
they have to be uh, going fast enough so that when they collide, they can fuse. In order to accomplish that, you have to have a high enough kinetic energy and uh, that kinetic energy, you require millions of degrees Celsius. So again, not practical here on Earth. And as you can see, these positrons being released here, little green things. So yeah, fusion occurs in the sun. So that is it. Um, if you could please load up, oh, I have to publish it first. So I'm gonna publish the worksheet that we're gonna work on. So 20-2 nuclear chemistry worksheet, loading it on my screen. Okay, it is now published. It should be in your upcoming tab. If not, find it in the week 14 folder. It is called 20-2 nuclear chemistry worksheet. So please load that up. Looks like this at the top. Give you a moment to do that. All right, let's look at what this is asking. So the, the first part um, deals with some isotopes. We have a ton of practice with, with this already. So it says for each of the following isotopes, write in any missing information about the particular isotope. So we have oxygen 15. How many protons and neutrons do we have? Remember 15 is the mass number. We can get the number of protons from the atomic number, look it up on the periodic table. And then we get the number of neutrons from taking the mass number, subtracting the protons and getting the neutrons. So we'll do that for all of these ones. So we'll fill out this whole table for isotopes. And then for the next section, it says to identify the following as alpha, beta, gamma, or neutron. So looking at these symbols, determine which ones they are. Uh, you'll notice that they have these little fraction symbols here. Those are only there because in order to type uh, the superscript on the left and the subscripts on the left needed to put a fraction. So kind of ignore those fraction lines. Those aren't typically there. Um, so number five, six, seven through 10, uh, again, we're, we're continuing to match whether those are describing alpha, beta, gamma, or neutrons. Next, it moves on to balancing decay reactions. So it says fill in the missing parts of each of the following decay reaction formulas. And so uh, I kind of leave a, a blank for each one. And so if the first one, it's alpha decay. So what would we get a, as a result? This one is beta decay. What would we get as a result? This one, we have to figure out what type of decay it is and put the particle here. And then this one, and we could see it's beta decay. What was the starting particle? Okay. And then we have more of the same um, 11 through 16. The second page is what we call a decay series. Okay. The decay series work like this they start with an isotope. It shows the decay, and then you see what the next isotope is. So we're just showing a series of transmutations. And through the decay process, this isotope is going to get more and more and more stable until it arrives at something that's not going to decay anymore. And so in all the ovals, we're putting the type of decay, alpha or beta. And then in all the squares, we're putting the isotope that is there. And so if you look at this first one, uranium-238, loses an alpha particle, so 238 minus four, that's 234. Uranium has an atomic mass of 92, so alpha particle is two, so 92 minus two is 90. So that's thorium-234. Beta, so we're converting a neutron to a proton, so we go from atomic mass or atomic number of 90 to 91, and we get uh, this one, uh, I think it's protactinium, and the mass number is the same. Then we undergo beta decay and get uranium-234. Alpha decay, what did we get? And then from this one, we get this isotope. What type of decay was that? So on and so forth. You could fill in all of the ovals and all of the squares. Okay. Um, this is another one. It's just in a, a little bit different of a format. In all the boxes, we have the isotopes. And then we were showing um, whether it's alpha or beta with the symbols. So this is the lowercase Greek letter alpha, and this is beta. And then you could also see that. Um, the mass is the vertical axis. So 
when it undergoes alpha decay, it's decreasing mass. When it goes undergoes, or actually we're, we're graphing the number of protons. When it undergoes alpha decay, we're losing two protons, so it drops down. When we undergo beta decay, we convert our neutron to a proton, so it goes up diagonally, up one. Beta decay, up one again. Alpha decay, down two. Alpha decay, down two. Alpha decay, well, I just gave you an answer, but we have to figure out what kind of decay this is. So you put an alpha sign right here. Let's see what type this is. What type is this? What type is this? You can see that this one actually has two pathways. It can undergo beta or alpha, okay, to get to stable lead 208. So we have two uh, decay series to complete the top one, complete the bottom one, all right? And that is the worksheet. So it is 1032. We go to 1045, work on this till the end of class, and the rest is homework, and that is listed. The due date is currently listed at the end of class. I'll upgrade that to 8 a.m. tomorrow, okay? Uh, if you have any questions, I will be in the Google Meet for the rest of the class. Otherwise, you're free to leave. Have a good one. You too.